Zhou Yi in NCU and also uh, Hong Minghui in NUU. So this is the current version now. So now the start of the story. I will tell you uh, some of the flights. This COSI project, um, we have we had already several flights. For example, here in 2005, our US partner actually had already a flight carrying two pieces of detector. At that time, our Taiwanese team has not yet joined this collaboration. We joined the project uh, since 2006. And then, after we joined the project, and we make very good electronics and so on, so the US team can save money to buy more crystals, so we have more detectors. And so we had a quite successful flight in 2009, that I will show you some pictures carrying 10 detectors. And then, and then in 2010, this one is the reason of the symbol of unlucky, uh, because uh, during the launch, the, uh, the, the whole mission actually crashed, the gondola crashed. That's fine, because uh, fortunately, our detector was actually quite okay after the crash. And then, 2014, we went to Antarctica with a relatively short flight. And then this year, this year, we went to uh, New Zealand, have a very long balloon flight. And it was quite successful. So maybe later I will put more time on this uh, mission here. And we are now, uh, besides analyzing the data that we obtained in this mission, we are now preparing for another flight, another balloon flight in, uh, expected to be have in uh, 2018, again from New Zealand, also to have a, a travel duration for flight. Okay, so this is more or less the current status, and at the same time, actually we are trying to write some proposal, proposals to submit to NASA for SMEX uh, program. Yes, SMEX program. Okay, all right. So now comes a lot of pictures back to year 2006, roughly, 2006 and 2007. Uh, we try to make all electronics, and this is actually in a lab in National Central University, and our people making some electronics, blah blah blah. And well, this is in Berkeley. We have Gondola. Later, I will explain to you in more details about Gondola. So this is uh, the instrument cradle. Instrument cradle. The instrument is inside this golden cryostate as you can see here, this array. This is the old array that we use with 10 detectors. And we have some shielding to shield uh, the surrounding and the bottom, and the bottom, some BGO shielding. Okay, and this is in New Mexico, in the launching site, some test, uh, before launch, some uh, assembly and testing. And here, you, you have already seen the instrument cradle, Is there a second pointer? These are maybe some words. Okay, it works sometimes. Yeah, anyway, so this is the instrument cradle, and um, okay. I have something else. So if you don't mind, I use this one. Okay. So this is the instrument cradle that you just uh, saw. This one is somewhere here, and this the whole thing is the gondola, and we have solar panel here, and some other instrument from NASA. And the whole thing, the whole thing is like this small when it is up in the air with the balloon. Okay. And then this 2009 flight was uh, on May 17th. So you see, there's a broom, and then it's connected to a crane, and you can rise here. Again, this is some pictures there. And during the launch, this, this point will be released first, and then the broom will go up, go up, up here, and then when it is right up here, then the crane will release the gondola, and then the instrument, the pedal, will be launched. Okay, that's basically the story. So it was quite successful. And then it float, and we have some pictures. And then at that time, it flew from New Mexico to Arizona somewhere. Before reaching California, it was cut down. So 
So uh, the duration of that fight uh, was uh, 38 hours, which was said to be the longest one, somehow 38 hours, longest one in New Mexico, I mean, in, among all of missions uh, launched in New Mexico. Okay, so this is a picture, a, a drawing basically, of the broom when it was up, up there. The height, the altitude is roughly 33 kilometers above the surface. So up there, the broom is quite large, 150 meters, 150 meters. On the ground, it's less than 10 meters. Okay. And up there, you can see it's very, very large. So that's because the, uh, yeah, because the air there is very, very dilute. So it, yeah, so it, it expands. All right, so after some hours, then we cut it down so it, it falls back somewhere, and then we, we send some people to recover it, and we also have some <coughs> local news here. All right, so that was uh, 2009 flight, which was quite okay. And this one is a very unfortunate one. Actually, I, I intended to skip this one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, it just crashed, and that's it. <laughs> so, so I won't go into any details. Uh, you can see it's crashed. Okay, you can see it's crashed. BBC News and so on. So bad news rise very fast. But anyway, um, okay. So it's over. Um, that was in uh, April, April 29, year 2010. After that incident, NASA actually stopped suspend. Suspended all the balloon flight, okay, because NASA has some some uh, site on um, um, the Earth to have this kind of operation, and then they try to investigate what what went wrong, what went wrong, okay, and then after half a year, NASA published a report. I I, I would say I would say this thick yeah, because I received an electronic version, so I, I won't see this thick, but that's uh, more than one thousand pages. And then the major conclusion is that, uh, well, the crane, the crane, oh, the reason of that accident, well, I probably should not skip that. <laughs> the reason of that, the reason of that accident is that the crane somehow could not release the payload at the time it should have released. Somehow, it could not. So it tried, but it's a crane, so it can move around. And then try, and then try. At some point, that crane actually tried to turn around because that crane was already close to the fence of that airport. That, that is in an airport. So that crane tried to turn around, and that time, this one somehow was broken, broken. So the, the whole thing fell down to the ground. Okay. And uh, at that time, one car, one civilian car, was uh, damaged. And the driver of that car was outside the car because she, a lady, she was watching the balloon launch because local news say, oh, there will be a balloon launch there, very, very exciting and so on. So some audience were there. Yeah. And that lady witnessed the collision between our gondola and her car. Okay. Anyway. But I, thought, I thought your uh, gondola uh, did, uh, no. did, no. did uh, launch and hit some bar. No, hit the car. Hit the, yeah. car, hit the car, hit the car, and it actually did not really launch. It broken here, and then, the of course, it's at this kind of height, and then broken and dropped somewhere. Dropped somewhere, so you can see all these kind of things dropped somewhere, yeah. And uh, of course, we collect all things, and then the good thing is that the detectors were quite good. <laughs> we took them back to the lab and tested them. They are good. Okay. The one thing which was damaged is the BGO shielding. There are some, there are some something, yeah, something uh, broken in the crystal, in the BGO crystal. Okay, so we replaced BGO shielding with cesium iodide in later uh, flight. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so NASA owed us one flight. Yeah, because that's NASA's brand. NASA's crane, okay? And then they say that 
the conclusion of that report is that uh, one should pay special attention to the maintenance, the regular maintenance of the crank, particularly put some oil here regularly. That's the conclusion. Okay, that's the conclusion. So all the balloon flight uh, were uh, started again from December that year. All right. But anyway, because that was crashed, so we have no data. But fortunately, in 2009, we, we did have a good flight. So with that data, with that 38-hour flight, basically with 20-hour data, yeah, we had a detection of crack. This is... Uh, an image that we, we, we obtained, and this is a crack. And this detection is, well, I think, is roughly six sigma detection. So if you are a astronomer, you may say, whoa, crap. Everyone can see a crap. But this is the first, the first crack detection among all the efforts for the next generation Compton telescope. There are several groups on the Earth trying to make so-called next generation Compton telescope, because the previous generation um, has um, poor sensitivity. And now we are trying to make compact one, and then to achieve better sensitivity. And among all this effort, this is the first one, the first crack detection. So this is good, so we published a paper somewhere. Okay, yeah. By the way, in this collaboration, starting, I believe, from uh, Stephen Post started this project since last century, I believe so. Up to here, up, up to now, this is the only this is the only publication in in a journal, in a in a science journal. Okay. We of course have a lot of publications in proceedings, SPI proceedings, IEEE, something from we have, we do have a lot of them. But this is the only one in MJ, yeah, because we are still now changing the instrument. But this is the first detection switch, so which is kind of cornerstone of all the effort. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. Uh, I will skip this one again, uh, because this is a big one. I just want to sh tell you that all the data that you record basically is background, it's noise, yeah. And you have to find out what you want in this noise. Okay, so let's come to the next flight. So we were pre preparing for the 2014 flight, in Antarctica, and at that time we changed the configuration of the instrument. Now we use two by two by three, so altogether 12 detectors. And with this configuration, actually, it's better to be in this configuration for polarization uh, detection. It's better this way. But anyway, there are other technical issues which menace choose this, this kind of configuration. Yeah. Like uh, the, cry the cryostate actually uh, was already there in UC Berkeley. That's uh, available one. So we we'll use that one, this kind of thing. So anyway, you are now more or less familiar with uh, the Gandhara thing. So let's move forward. And at this point, I probably should uh, mention to you the performance. Of course, the result here is based on simulation. For example, <coughs> let's see. Line, line sensitivity, line sensitivity, for example, the horizon, this is the energy, okay, this is the energy, and this is sensitivity. Uh, NCD, that is causing, is here in this red area. And there are some other missions here, for example, Comtel, which you barely see, Comtel is here, and then SPI, which is another, another instrument, which is now still working, is here. But this is for megasecond, megasecond, and this is for 200 days. So we are somewhat cheating, but anyway, they are similar, they are similar. If you consider the integration time, of course, this is, of course, large, maybe 10 times larger than that. And this is one order. So I would say they are similar, they are similar. There's a nice sensitivity, they are similar. But SPI, like Comtel, is a huge instrument two or three meters, several tons. And this one is this large. I can put it on this table, this large. And certainly less than 100 kilograms. They can have comparable sensitivity. 
So if we have a satellite and we can make our instrument somewhat larger, then certainly we can have better sensitivity than the previous missions. Okay. And the line sensitivity is important because as, as I tried to emphasize at the beginning of my talk, the detection of nuclear synthesis lines. This is one example. This is the first detection of nuclear synthesis lines from throughout Taiwan Bay. Taiwan Bay is robot. This is published in 2014. And then this is from Cobo line at this energy, KV, this energy and this energy. And where is it? If you, if you don't have the solid line here, you probably you are probably unable, are unable to identify where, where they are lines, yeah? But anyway, the radars here are data, and uh, the solid line here is a model, a model. So you see there's a line here, and there's a line here, okay? So this is the first detection, if you agree to say this is detection, okay? So that shows us, gosh, sensitivity is very important. And then, because later, if we have better, better measurement, then the strength of the line is important to our understanding of the uh, so model. models. Okay. So this field is really in its infant stage in terms of measurement. Okay. All right. And the second example is the famous Sukhova 1987A, which is uh, type two Sukhova. That's Sukhova. The detection is like this. The lower panel here is the measurement in that direction before before the supernova event. And then it's like this. After the supernova event, it's like this. And then somehow astronomers claim there are detections here. Again, the same couple lines. This is marble, okay? So if you agree then this is another detection, but this is for type two supernova. So these are the only two nuclear synthesis lines that has that has been measured, detected by human being on Earth, of course. Okay? Yeah? Alright. So line sensitivity is also important for the five hundred eleven KV lines. If this shows you a earlier map like this and then later map like this. With SPI, this instrument this is 2005 and this is 2008. Yes, 2008. And then with more and more data, then you can know more details. But yeah, that's the message that I, that I want to say. So I'm eager to see to see some new measurement. Yeah, whether we do have this asymmetry or not. Yeah. And it's really tricky to make an image, as I showed you before. We need to reconstruct the event, and we need to do some imaging processing, and we need to put in some signatures like reliable. Yeah, so it, it may not be always reliable. All right. So continuous sensitivity. So it's similar to other missions, just like line emission, and polarization. This is a more complicated issue. So here again, energy. Uh, Flux. Yeah, because if you have more photons, then you are more uh, likely to detect the polarization. So this is flux in this energy range. Okay, and this is a polarization degree, polarization degree, linear polarization degree. So far, uh, in this energy range, I think Crime Nebula and Sigma One have already been detected. To have some polarization already. For a crab, there were two reports with different polarization degrees. They are not really consistent to each other. So these are the two reports. And Sigma has one as one. And these are some estimate of other sources. And uh, our sensitivity is here. It's here. It says if you have less flux, then you need to have more polarization so that you can detect it, yeah, okay? So it looks, it looks very nice. If we can have 200 day interpretation for some source, okay? All right, so uh, the crap. This is the crap polarization that I mentioned, and maybe I, I, 
that's what skip right there because we have not yet come to Antarctica and also New Zealand flight this year, right? So let me skip this one. So now for the Antarctica flight, this is a flight in uh, 2014. So our plan, our plan was to launch the room from McMurdo, and then we hope it can turn around and maybe turn the second round to have uh, 50 days, 60 days flight. That's, that was our hope. That was our hope. And so some pictures, I also went there, you see this is my name, and then this is the airplane that I took and to McMurdo Station. We launched the flight in Mac, near McMurdo Station. We didn't go to the South Pole. Maybe Pearson went to the South Pole, right? Yeah, I still remember your picture. But our Anita project is not near South Pole. Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay, so again, some pictures. Oh, by the way, this is the flag of Chiang University. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, near McMurdo. Uh -huh. So just show some pictures. So uh, before launch, right before launch, uh, Alan, Alan Cho, a postdoc, and Martin and Abby, they were there. I was not there. I, I have already uh, come back. Uh, so this right before launch, and this is a balloon. Our Gantola is here. This is a crane. We hope it will work well. <laughs> All right, so it was successfully launched. So this is right after launch. The balloon is up there, up there. And there is a parachute, parachute. And that's OK, the balloon, the Gantola, this one, this one is here. And then it goes up and up, and the balloon gets bigger and bigger. So, but. After about 44 hours, we decided to cut it down. So the hope was to have a flight something like this. But what actually happened was a short flight. And uh, the reason, the main reason, is that there was a leak in the room. So, uh, so the NASA, the CSPF people, were not confident to have uh, flight this way because they worry that if the broom flew to somewhere here and then somehow we cannot control it and fell down here, it's not easy to recover and maybe it will be it's already night time there maybe so at that time we decided to cut it down. Yeah. Okay. So again, you, NASA's fault. You used a high pressure bomb, right? This is um, yes. This is kind of uh, conventional. So again, NASA's fault. <laughs> so uh, we go, uh, this is after the Kazan. The Gandula is now on the ground somewhere in Antarctica. Actually, 560 kilometers away from McMurdo. So we recover all the things, yeah. All right, then prepare for the flight from New Zealand, from New Zealand. We run that one again to fly around, around the earth, around the earth. When in Antarctica, it's also around the earth, yeah. Similar, but at different uh, latitude. So uh, in New Zealand, actually it's better. We didn't really want to go to Antarctica for our MBB photo measurement because their particle backgrounds is much stronger in the polar region. So it's not good for our experiment. So why did we go there? As I said, NASA owed us one flight. So NASA asked us whether we want that flight to Antarctica. We said, we said, oh, why not? Yeah, so let's go. Yeah, OK. But New Zealand is a good one. And also, in New Zealand, at this latitude, if our payload go around the Earth, probably, and you can see there are a lot of interesting objects. The elevation angle is quite uh, high enough like galactic center, like this is a black hole binary, and this is AGN, this is Pausa, and also um, massive stars. So it's a good site to launch the flight for this kind of experiment. All right, so we went there. Mm -hmm. This is Wanaka, Wanaka Airport. Uh, NASA has a balloon launching site there. And people working. Messy, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so we did our work there in Malacca to, uh, to test the 
instrument to assemble them and then do a lot of uh, testing, including uh, communication and power and so on. Okay. So finally, this is so-called hand test. A lot of time we we weigh, we also weigh the whole uh, gondola and we check the power, whether the power is working okay or not. And then let's see the crane. Okay, the crane. Good. Hang test. And then pictures. Okay. You cannot recognize who is who, right? Okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh. And also local uh, media was also quite interested in our mission. So uh, this is from uh, local media, uh, some media called Stuff. Okay. <laughs> Stuff in New Zealand. And so they take a picture. This is Dylan Box. This is of me. And this is someone from NASA. Um, she is uh, head of the Bloomy uh, program. Okay. And this is the team there at the time. Okay. This is around uh, uh, end of March this year. So after we. <laughs> After we were flight ready, so we try to have some launch, and uh, this is a picture taken during launch attempt number three. Okay, so um, we try to launch, and then, but it depends on the weather. So early in the midnight, we went to the hangar and then prepare all the things, and even tow the thing out, and then when the sun rises and there is a Commander, field commander, which is from NASA, CSPF, he decided whether to go or not. He will release some small balloon to see how wind goes, yeah, and then decide whether to go. So this is attempt number three, and this one didn't go. Number three. And then the fourth attempt was successful. So again, May 17, somehow. Uh, if you remember, this is also May 17, 2009 in New Mexico. Anyway, so this is before launch. Room, and then connected here to the crane, and gondola is here, and after launch. Okay, it's a beautiful one, beautiful one. And uh, this is a small pilot room. Uh, it's independent to this, but th this one is, is the one the field commander used to check the wind, wind direction. All right, so this one, this is a picture taken by someone. So if you remember earlier, I showed you a drawing, a drawing, 150 meters. That one was a draw, drawing, and this one is a picture taken by someone. I, I, I don't know who, and yeah, that's nice, yeah? So this is about 150 meters, and we, we can really see the camera here, very small. All right, so it flies. And on May 13th, on May 30th, somehow we detect a GRB. And uh, there, are, there are details, because we receive the data real time. Almost, yeah, I think it's, it's real time. And uh, we have already designed some mechanism to alert people that there are something strange. So we got to alert. And then all the team members actually, particularly those people in Berkeley, they uh, stayed up all night to make images decide location and then produce the light curve here. This is 10 seconds. This is 10 seconds. And this is cosy, cosy light curve. And then the second day, uh, one of our team members in France, um, Pierre Jean, uh, because he is in our team, so he knows our discovery. And also, we also put it on GCN, GCN, yes, yeah. And Swift also tried to observe the possible afterglow, but, but uh, nothing was detected. SPI, if you still remember, SPI is, is also a huge instrument on Interpol. They have kind of, uh, kind of data, and then Pierre Jean, he he's heavily involved in SPI. He also pick out the light curve in that direction at that time. And then he sent us the SPI light curve. Gosh, it's almost the same. Yeah. So it's a real detection. And quite strong, very strong one. And I believe some